Hello, my name is Tim. I'm with the Centers for Apologetics Research, and today I want to talk to you about Andrew Womack. Andrew Womack falls under the category of a word faith teacher, sometimes called word faith, word of faith, uh, prosperity gospel, health and wealth gospel. And by this, we mean the belief system where your power, your words have the power to create uh, different realities. Uh, and usually they're focused on the subjects of health and wealth, that your words can have the power to create health, they have the power to create financial gain as well. And Andrew Womack is one of these that focuses on these. Now, he has a, a big following across the world, and I think part of his appeal is that uh, he doesn't focus so much on the financial aspect. A lot of word faith teachers that focus on the financial aspect of their teaching end up, um, I think, losing a lot of their potential audience because some people see it as greed. Andrew Womack, you're not going to hear a lot of the outrageous statements that I've heard from many word faith teachers that could be categorized as just this big greed thing. Uh, he seems a lot more humble, so a lot of uh, people uh, catch on to that and like to follow that. His focus is more on the health aspect of the word faith theology. And God wants you completely healthy instead of always focusing on the wealthy. He'll touch on that, but that's not his his main thing. Now, just a, a brief uh, look at the history to know where he came from. In uh, 1976, he started his Gospel Truth radio program, and in 1994, he started a Karis Bible College, and in the year 2000, his Gospel Truth program became a television program, and it's been running ever since. You can go online to his Andrew Womack Ministries and you can find all of his TV programs there for free. And I think that's another part of his appeal is that uh, if there's any kind of CD or any teaching that he's done that uh, you're interested in, if you don't have the money to pay for it, he will offer it to you for free. So he draws in people that way with his uh, ability to give things away. He's not always asking for money for everything that he has. Now, his appeal is very much lar largely worldwide. Um, they have 26 locations across the United States for his Karis Bible College, but they're across the world as well. As you can see from this map, there are 21 international locations. They have a lot of locations in uh, Europe, as you can see, in Africa, three different places. They're also in Asia and in Australia. So, Andrew Womack has a very wide reach in his teaching. A lot of people are following him across this world. The vision statement of Karis Bible College is something that uh, uh, we find kind of enlightening or maybe even troubling. Um, this, this part, this is only part of his vision statement. If this is all his vision statement said right here, I think that we wouldn't have a problem with it. Sending leaders to proclaim the truth of the gospel throughout America and the world. Well, that sounds pretty good, isn't it? That's part of the Great Commission sending people out to proclaim the gospel. But that's not his entire vision statement. The entire vision statement is change the body of Christ's perception of God by preparing and sending leaders to proclaim the gospel throughout America and the world. So the main thrust of his vision statement is their focus is on Christians to reach out to them and change their understanding and their perception of God. So what we want to do in this video is look at what is Andrew Womack's perception of God and is it biblical? Is this something, this vision of God, something that we should listen to or something that we should reject? So let's take a look. The first category that I want to look at is sickness, poverty, and suffering. What is Womack's view? First of all, Andrew Womack says in one of his books here, he says, it is a false teaching to claim that God is the one who causes people to die or that God puts sickness on you to humble you for some redemptive purpose to perfect you through all this suffering. So it's false teaching to claim that God is the one that's responsible for this. So to, summar to summarize this, uh, number one, God does not cause people to become poor, sick, or die. God is not the author of this, according to Womack. Instead, sickness and suffering would come from three possible sources. Uh, number one, from sin, but not in the sense of punishment he would say, but of cause and effect. Uh, B, natural consequences, and D, the main place where he rests is the idea of demonic. This is the source of 
sickness, poverty, and suffering. Sickness and disease is often demonic. Krankheit und Gebrechen ist oft dämonischen Ursprungs. Depression and poverty and things like that are demonic. So even though he will acknowledge that sin and natural consequences could be the source of your poverty, sickness, and suffering, and so on, uh, the demonic is where he mainly rests. Because even though these other things might be a source of your sickness or your suffering, if you continue in that sickness and suffering and poverty, well, that's because of the demonic world. You're listening to the demonic world. The way to get out of sickness and poverty and suffering would be from what we're going to find out later through the power of words. But let's look at what does the Bible teach? Is Andrew Womack right here? Is God not the source of this? Well, let's look at a few verses. Exodus 4.11 says, The Lord said to Moses, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight? Or who makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, that doesn't need a lot of fancy interpretation to be able to tell what he's saying here. Who is the source of who gives them sight, who makes them blind? Well, it's God. So I can say, number one, under Bible teaching, is God may cause sickness and death. Now, this doesn't mean that God is behind every sickness and death that's out there, but according to Exodus 4.11, God can be a source for this. Another verse, Deuteronomy 32.39, says this, See now that I myself am he, there is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have, uh, I have wounded and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. God can be the source of even death, according to Deuteronomy. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, says this, The Lord brings to death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. God could be the source of sickness, poverty, and suffering. He may do this. Now, this doesn't mean that God is... Uh, uh, a cruel God, uh, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but still it's evident that according to the scriptures is that God could be the source from this. And this isn't just in the Old Testament. James chapter 4 verse 15 so it says, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Because it, it could be the Lord's will that maybe you wouldn't live. So even in the New Testament times, it's the same God doing the same things. God could be the source of are not continuing to even live according to James chapter 4. Now the second point I want to make here is God may use these things for our good. Uh, Andrew Womack and other word faith teachers would say that no God would never use these bad things in our lives to teach us good. He only teaches us good through scripture. However the Bible teaches otherwise. Look here in uh, Psalms chapter 119, verse 67 and uh, verse 71 says this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. And 71, it was good for me that I might be afflicted, that I might learn your decrees. So the psalmist is declaring that because of his affliction, he came to know and understand God. We learn uh, more sometimes through affliction than we do through prosperity. When everything is going perfect for us, we don't necessarily reach out for God as much as when things aren't working out as well. Now this is one example of how we came, one person might have come to know God, but how about after we know God? Revelation 3.19 clarifies, Those whom I love, according to God, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. See, God can use these things in our lives as discipline. As a good father, I want to discipline my children to teach them right from wrong. And not just tell them what's right and wrong, but when they do wrong, uh, I can use discipline to help teach and correct and reprove. And that's what we see God do to his people as well. He uses discipline to bring them back. So, God may cause sickness and death. God may use these things for good. But we don't always know why God allows or causes these situations. It's not always something that we're told exactly what's going on. I don't think that we knew in the end in the book of Job exactly what God was doing with Job. 
but we know in the end Job understood that he could still trust God throughout all of these things. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 verse 28. A lot of Christians know these this verse whether they're word faith or uh, regular evangelical. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. We like that first because it says hey God is going to work out everything for our good. We want things to be for our good. But to understand this verse, there's two questions that we need to ask. First of all, what are the all things that it's, he's talking about? Well, in context, look at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. So in context, he's talking about the sufferings. So bad things going on in our lives. And we know that, so verse 28, and we know that in all things, in all these sufferings, all these problems, God can still work these things together for good for us. So the first question is, what was he talking about with the all things? Now, what is the good that he's trying to work? Is it our prosperity, our, our health, and our wealth? Is he working everything to good for good so that we can have a good, wonderful life? No. Verse 29 gives us the context. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, what does it mean to be conformed to the image of his son? Uh, that's an area of theology we call sanctification. You're growing closer to God. You're um, knowing him better. You're following him better. You're um, cleansing yourself from sin in your life. You're recognizing what's right and what's wrong and doing what's right and forsaking what's wrong. So. God is not an evil God because he might cause certain things in our lives. He can use these things together in our lives for our good. And the good is drawing us closer to him. God wants us to be holy, not just rich and healthy. Those aren't the main things. Basically, God wants us to come to this point uh, where Habakkuk did in chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Habakkuk says, Though the fig tree does not bud... And there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Now, just think about that right there. Is, is Habakkuk talking about prosperity? No, an extreme lack of prosperity. N basically, no sustenance. The crops are failing. The fig tree is not budding. The, the olive crop's failing. There is no prosperity. Yet, Habakkuk can still say in verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God my Savior. So in the face of adversity, in the face of suffering, we can still trust God and be joyful in Him as Habakkuk did. Next category of teaching let's look at is the subject of prosperity. And when I say prosperity, I'm thinking of an encompassing term, not just financial prosperity, but prosperity of health, prosperity of your finances. All of this can be an umbrella term and is for a lot of word faith teachers. So Womack's teaching of prosperity, number one, God wants you to have prosperity. That's what God really wants of you. You are his child. He is the king. And as a child of the king, he would want you to have prosperous. He wants you to be prosperous. So he would want to take care of your healing. He wants to take care of all of your financial provi provisions. Number two, prosperity is already ours. We already have all the prosperity that we could potentially need. When you got born again, you became exactly identical to the Lord Jesus Christ in your spirit. Everything that Jesus is and has, you have in your spirit. You're identical. You have the same power, the same anointing, the same faith, the same joy, the same peace. All of these things are already in you. You don't need to pray and ask God for any of this. If you've been joined unto the Lord, you are one with the Lord. Your spirit has all of the knowledge in it that Jesus has. Now you may be wondering, how can he possibly back that up? How are we identical to Jesus? How do we have everything that Jesus has? Well, he explains this here with this verse. 
1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say so are we going to be in the future world. So are we going to be in heaven. We sing these songs about when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. In the sweet by and by, but nobody likes the rough now and now. Amen. <laughs> but you know what? This scripture says, as He is, so are we in this world. So let's look at the Bible's teaching. First of all, we want to address this 1 John uh, 4, 17 that he brought up. Uh, it's in the King James Version that he read, as, as He is, so are we in this world. Well, I've been using NIV, so let's look at what it says here. It says, in this world, we are like Jesus. It's still saying basically the same thing. But does this verse mean that we are identical to Jesus, that we have all the power that he has, all the knowledge that he has? Well, maybe if it means that, does it also mean that we have long hair and we have sandals and we have holes in our hands and our feet? No, that would just be silly. Of course, it's not talking about that. Well, how do we understand what it's talking about? If it's not talking about long hair and sandals, how can we say that it's talking about we have all his knowledge, we have all of his uh, power? Well, what we need to do is look in the context to see what is John talking about when he says that uh, in this world that we are like Jesus. Well, when we look in the context, we don't see that or we have everything. There's something specific that he's thinking of. 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 12, look at what he says. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Now, this complete in us means um, whole, perfected. If we love one another, God's love has been perfected and is complete in us. And that's what God wants in us, for us to love one another. In verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And so we want confidence in the day of judgment, right? We're talking about salvation. Uh, how can we know that we have this salvation? Well, if we have this love for one another. And that's in the context where he says, at the end of verse 17, in this world we are like Jesus. Now, Jesus from heaven loves us completely and thoroughly. And in this world we are to reflect that love. And if we reflect that love, we have the confidence in the day of judgment. So he's narrowly defining what he means by in this world we are like Jesus. It doesn't mean we're going to have everything that Jesus has, but we are to reflect Jesus and his love for others. We are to love others like Jesus did. Second thing is under the Bible's teaching is God is interested in our prosperity. I'm not trying to say that God doesn't care about uh, where we are in our finances and our health. I believe in a God who heals. I've been healed myself. I've seen others healed miraculously of, of, of several things. So please know this, that I do agree. God heals. He is a healing God. However, God doesn't isn't going to heal us completely of everything in this life. He is going to heal maybe temporarily of some things, but eventually some things will come back. So we won't fully receive until the future. 1 Corinthians 4.16 illustrates this. Paul says, and this is a New American Standard, I really like the way that it renders this verse. It says, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So our inner man being renewed day by day, what does that mean? Again, sanctification. Growing spiritually. As you grow spiritually, what does he say? You, even though our outer man is decaying, your physical body, though it is falling apart, your inner man is being renewed. That's the normal course of life. Your outer man decays. It starts to fall apart. And while that happens, your inner man, your spiritual man, can grow. A lot of Word Faith teachers say, will say that there's a spiritual law that as you grow spiritually, you will grow in your prosperity, your finances and your health and everything will grow as you grow spiritually. However, Paul flips it on the reverse and says that no, as your physical body de deteriorates, your spiritual body is the one that we're working on. It's the next life that we get a body that is going to be not corrupting. 
in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about the resurrection body and it compares it with our current body. Our current body is uh, corruptible, the, the resurrection body is incorruptible. In other words, our bodies now will fade and fall apart. But in the future, we're going to get a resurrected body that's going to be perfect and not fall apart. So God is interested in healing us here in this lifetime, and he does that. However, we won't find the full effects, the full prosperity, full health and wealth until the next life. Then all of our needs will be met perfectly. All of our health, all of our finances, everything that we need will be taken care of. But that's in the next life. Now let's look at Womack's view of prayer and faith. Uh, first of all, his teachings on prayer. Womack will tell you, don't ask God for things. You're not supposed to ask God. When you go to God in prayer, you don't ask Him for things. That probably the majority of you ask God, Oh God, please pour out your love in my life. Oh God, give me more faith. Oh God, touch me and heal my body. Do you know all of those are wrong prayers? The truth is, God has already done everything. In your spirit, your spirit is perfect and complete. And instead of spending the rest of your life asking God for these things, it should be you releasing, discovering what you already have in your spirit and releasing it. So you see, the reason you don't ask God for things is because you already have all things. And we saw that in the clip earlier. We have everything that Jesus has. Uh, therefore, you don't ask God for things. So if you don't feel like you have everything, you might have a cold, you might have problems with your finances. How can you say that we have everything and it doesn't seem like we do? Well, it's because we need to have faith. And now let's look at his view of faith. Faith compromises, I'm sorry, faith, faith comprises two different things. First of all, it uh, comprises belief. Now, of course, Christians were not against the idea of belief, but he's, they're thinking of belief differently than what the common Christian understanding of belief is. You have to believe that you receive right now, and then you shall in the future have them. That future might be only a minute. It might be 10 minutes. It might be a day. It might be a week. But you have to believe that you receive now, and then you shall, future tense, see it. So when he's saying believe, he's not just saying that we believe and we trust God, that God is going to provide, but that you believe that you have already received this prosperity that you want. You believe that, say, if your arm is broken and you want your arm to not be broken, well, you need to believe that it's already healed. It doesn't matter what your physical senses might say. It might say that you're in a lot of pain but you're supposed to believe right now that you're healed. If you go with just what your physical senses say, well, you could be in big trouble. Listen how he explains. So to be spiritually minded is to be thinking according to the Word. If you are thinking according to the Word, all that produces is life and peace. If you are thinking according to your five senses and going only by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, then you are going to die. You will die physically. You will die in your emotions. You'll die in your finances because you're only going to go by the physical, natural things. So just relying on your physical senses, that's wrong. You need to believe, believe already that you have been healed. Now what's interesting is, word faith teachers would normally tell you, if you have a broken arm, believe that that arm is healed. Present tense, believe that it is healed. But they'll also recommend, yeah, go to the hospital, of course, and get a cast on it. My question is, why would you go to the hospital to have your arm put in a cast if you believe that it was healed? My arm was broken, and it's not in a healed cast right now because I believe that it was healed. It was broken decades ago. <laughs> it had a cast put on it, and it's healed. It doesn't have a cast on it anymore now because I believe completely that it's healed. My question to Andrew Womack and other Word Faith teachers and followers is that if you really truly believe that your arm is healed, why would you go to a doctor in order to have it looked at? If you believe that it's healed, you shouldn't be going to a doctor. That's doubt. That's unbelief. But nevertheless, that's how they will define it. So faith compromises two things. First, belief, and then speaking. So it really comes down to that it has to be the combination of saying it and believing with your heart. 
So you believe it and then you speak it out. And this is how God created things. He believed in his heart and he spoke it out and this is how he created. This is how God created the heavens and the earth. It's how he created us. It's how he created plants. It's how he created animals. He spoke everything into existence. And since words are the parent force, everything that is created by words will respond to words. You can see Jesus talking to a fig tree and the fig tree responded to him, died immediately when he told it to die. He spoke to the wind. He spoke to the seas and said, peace, be still. And all of these things responded. Did you know physical, natural things will respond to words? But not only is this how God created things, this is how you can change your circumstances as well. You can change your health. You can change your finances. Listen. But I can tell you, if you would start speaking and prophesying and saying, bills, you are paid. Finances, you are coming in. And if you would start speaking your faith, things will obey you. Physical, natural things will obey you. All faith does is take what is already real in the spiritual world and make it physical. Faith is just a conduit through which the spiritual flows into the physical. But all of these things already exist in the spiritual world. This is not a Bible teaching. Let me give you three different responses to this. First of all, uh, when we pray, we are supposed to ask God for things. It's one of the things that we're told. For instance, think about when the disciples came to Jesus and asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Jesus told them to go to God and say, give us this day our daily bread. Well, what is that but a request? They're asking God for their daily bread. They didn't, Jesus didn't tell them to, to go to God and say, thank you God for this bread that I cannot see with my physical senses and touch and taste. No, you, you, you go to God and you ask God for things. 1 John 5.14 says this, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Keyword, ask. God wants you to ask. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to come to him and ask. Uh, one of my favorite verses on this subject would be Philippians 4, 6, which says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Present your requests to God. Asking God is not. A bad thing it's a good thing it's what he wants it's what he tells us uh, second response is faith and belief are the same thing now they seem like in the English they're two different words so they should be two different things but actually in the Greek they're the same word just a different function let me give you an example like the word bike that's a noun but you can say biking is a verb. It's the same word, bike or biking. It's just a different function of the same word. And that's what we have in the Greek with the word belief and faith. It comes from the Greek word pistis. Um, pistis has a noun form and there's a verb form. The noun is often, well, is always translated faith and the verb form is translated belief. I don't know why the translators didn't translate them both the same and have the noun form be belief with an F, but that's just the way they chose to translate it. So when Andrew Womack and the other word faith teachers try to make this big deal about faith and belief are two different things, well, if you look in the original language, Greek, which the New Testament was written in, their arguments don't hold up. Faith and belief come from the same word. And so therefore, they're talking about the same thing. It's just different functions of that word. Third point here is words do not have magical power. Now, what I mean by magical power is uh, this teaching of the word faith movement that our words have this ability to create and to destroy. And uh, this is not a new concept. Uh, people in Wicca, uh, they, they have this concept as well that you can use things in the physical world to affect things in the spiritual world. Uh, we think of, uh, of the witch with the eye of Newton, bat, wing of bat or whatever in the cauldron. Well, they can use physical things to change things in the spiritual world, but they can also use incantations by the words of their mouth. They can change things. 
and that's what the word faith movement is doing. So what they're advocating is something that's not a biblical teaching, but it's something that is borrowed from Wicca or the New Age movement. Um, and, and just think about the New Testament. It doesn't make sense, this teaching of our words having power. If you think about uh, the apostles uh, in Acts, what they're preaching and teaching people, they don't go around teaching people that your words have power and that you can change your circumstances. Or First Timothy chapter 5, Paul tells Timothy, who has uh, frequent illnesses, he says, take a little wine for your stomach. He doesn't say use the power of your words. And Paul also tells us uh, in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he talks about our bodies wasting away and falling apart and decaying. 2 Corinthians 4.16, he says that our bodies are decaying and wasting away. Why would he say that? if we could just use the power of our words to change our circumstances and our body wouldn't waste away. He doesn't do that because this is not a biblical teaching. Now, one of the verses that they often point to, and I've heard Andrew Womack point to, to, to promote their teaching that your words can create, is uh, this one here, Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they'll use this verse and say, look, according to this verse, your tongue, your words have power. They have power to create life and power to create death. Your tongue has that power. They're taking this verse way out of context, just like many other verses they take out of context. Well, of course, according to this verse, your tongue does have power, but it doesn't mean that it has magical power. Your tongue has power in that your tongue has influence, amazing influence. Just look in context. Verse 19 says, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. How do you offend a brother? With the power of your words. By saying something stupid, you can offend your brother. And I have heard stories of, uh, of, of families being broken apart for, for decades where they wouldn't talk to each other because somebody said something really bad. Now that doesn't mean power came out of their mouth and influenced the other person and caused them not to speak for years. No, they offended them. They said something bad, something wrong that broke up that relationship. So verses that they use to try to promote their teaching are often taken way out of context. I wish I had more time to, do, uh, to rest on this topic, but um, we, we need to move on. The last category is sovereignty versus authority. Now, when I use the word sovereignty, I'm not talking about uh, the debate that goes on between Calvin's, Calvinists and uh, Armenians. Now, if you don't know what those terms mean, don't worry about it. We're, we don't need to get into what Calvinists mean by sovereignty and what Armenians mean. Uh, however, for word faith teachers like Andrew Womack, when they use the word sovereignty, um, they're very much against it. Uh, they use it to mean basically that God is control here in control in the universe. They say he's not in control, and you're going to hear Andrew Womack say that. Instead of sovereignty, we as humans, we have this thing called authority. But let's listen to it from, um, from Andrew Womack. First of all, Andrew Womack would say that the common Christian belief about sovereignty is slander to God. It's slander against his character. And I think that the worst thing that has happened, the worst slander against God is the teaching on the sovereignty of God. Religion has come up with a whole new definition of sovereign that you can't find in a dictionary. It's only a religious connotation that goes along with it. And religion has said sovereign means God controls everything, that he's responsible for everything that happens to you. And I believe that that is the worst heresy in the body of Christ. It is absolutely untrue. And that has slandered God. I was watching a television program of a preacher and he actually interviewed a woman who this woman and her daughter were abducted at gunpoint, taken out into a field. They were brutally raped and then the man made them both lay face down and shot both of them in the back of the head. The daughter died, the mother survived and came through it. She had problems, but she was uh, still alive and she was on this television program talking about, well, God works all things together for good. We know that God had a purpose. And she blamed God for rape and murder, saying that this was God that controlled it. 
I'm telling you, that is a lie. That is a heresy. God does not do that. God does not control everything that happens. Being gang raped and my daughter shot in the head and killed and me shot and living, that was actually God's blessing. That's a deception and a lie of the devil. That's not a blessing. It's the devil coming to steal, kill, and to destroy. Some people just can't handle this stuff. You're saying it's my fault? Absolutely. I'm just, I'm, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, I haven't seen this video that he is uh, talking about, so I can't say with 100% certainty I know what was going on in it. But with enough conversations with uh, people in the Word Faith movement and listening to different Word Faith teachers, they often mischaracterize what evangelicals mean when we talk about suffering and tragedy in our lives. Uh, just like Habakkuk that we read, he wasn't saying that it was a blessing that the fig tree didn't bud, that um, there's blessing that there is poverty in the land and that there is no prosperity. That's not what evangelicals mean, so I think that there's a mischaracterization there. Instead, we know that even through these sufferings, that God is still there, can be trusted, and can still bless us. That there is some kind of ultimate meaning that might come out of some of these terrible situations. Now, the most that Andrew Womack can offer this woman is to say that it's your fault that you and your daughter were raped and shot and uh, your daughter died from it. That's all his theology can say. In one of his books, he talks about how uh, a son got shot and uh, was in the hospital for a few days and died and uh, people in the church came around and prayed and prayed, uh, healing over this child and uh, he eventually died. Well, Womack looked into the situation and come to find out that uh, as when the boy left the home that day, he had a big fight with his mom and his mom said, I hope you never come back into this house again. So Womack's conclusion was it was the mom's fault that the son died. So the son's death uh, is completely void of meaning. So if you don't have a God that's in control, that's what you have. There is no ultimate meaning. The, the suffering, the poverty, whatever that a person has gone through is emptiness. It's void of meaning. Whereas if God is in control, then, as we saw from many of the verses before, that God still can bring meaning and blessings through, not because of what happened, but through he can carry us through that suffering and bring the good into our lives. Now, instead of sovereignty, the Word Faith folks have this teaching called authority. Authority uh, implies the power of words and the ability to uh, command things with our words. So in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, God gave Adam authority in this world. When God said, you have dominion, the earth is yours, you rule it, you subdue it, God gave mankind authority over this earth. God created man to be a God over this earth. Not a capital G, not divinity, but in the sense of absolute ruler, absolutely in control. So you see, what carries on with the idea of authority and dominion for word faith teachers are the ability to have power with words, to be able to command things uh, to be and to not be. So in the beginning, God gave all authority to Adam, but Adam kind of messed up. Adam gave his authority to Satan when he sinned. Mankind is the one who released Satan into this earth, and God would have been unjust as a spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24 says God is a spirit. And he would have been unjust as a spirit to come down here and take back this authority and power that he had given us because it would have violated what he said. God never intended for us to turn it over to the devil, but when we did, he upheld our authority to do that. And this is how Satan became the god of this world. However, not all is lost. Because even though we handed over our authority through Adam to Satan, Jesus Christ brought it back to us. Jesus took the authority back. 
uh, on the cross when he came to die for our sins. So we get our authority back. God had to become a man because now he had authority in this earth because of his physical body. He gave physical human beings authority, people that have a physical body, and God is a spirit. So God had to become a man. No man could fix this problem because they were part of the problem. And finally, he took our sins upon himself, died for our sins, and when he rose from the dead, he completely stripped Satan of all of his power and authority. So now for us, when we go against God's will, like Adam did, when, when Adam went against what God told him to do, it caused the authority to transfer. Well, that still happens to us today. When we listen to the voice of Satan or any of the demons and we go against what God wants us to do, it puts power into their arms. It creates what they would have for us instead of what God would have for us. However, it's not a permanent thing. We don't permanently transfer all authority over to him for whatever reason. It's not explained, but now when we go against what God wants, we are still somehow transferring some bit of the limited authority over to Satan and causing those problems in our life. The truth is Satan is only using the power and the authority that God gave mankind. And he can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. So in the beginning, God gave all authority to Adam, who then gave it to Satan, who uh, lost it when Jesus came. And so authority came back to humans. But God does not have authority still. God never had authority after he gave it to Adam and Eve. Andrew Womack would say that that would be an unjust God to take authority back. So God gave authority to Adam and he released it from himself forever and he would never have authority. There is no conflict directly between God and the devil, but Satan is still fighting us and we have to take this God-given authority and use it to resist the devil. And if we don't do it, God is not going to do it for us. You could say God can't do it because he has given us this authority, told us to resist the devil, and he'll flee from us. And he's not going to violate his word. He's not going to change just because you're in a desperate situation. You have to learn your authority, and you have to start using it. Many people don't understand this, and they, they are in a crisis situation. Maybe they're dying of cancer. They've got some incurable disease, and they're pitiful, and they're praying, and they're saying, Oh, God, please heal me. And they're begging... God, and they're wondering, God, why haven't you healed me? I know you can do it. They don't doubt that God can heal. And they're praying and they desire it and they need it. And they just can't understand why it's not working for them. And yet, every person that comes up to them says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm dying. I'm going to die. The doctor says, unless I get a miracle, I'm dead. You speak forth your doubt and unbelief, and you just can't understand why you aren't being healed. It's because God upholds the universe by the integrity of His Word, and if He was to violate His own commands, where He told you to speak to your mountain and not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say comes to pass and you will have it, death and life are in the power of the tongue. If he was to violate his own instruction, the universe would blow up. He, it's his integrity. It's his truth. And he cannot just violate his instructions and come down. And even though you're, you're violating everything, you're speaking forth your unbelief instead of your faith. You're just speaking forth your doubt and fear. You're, you're going against everything he told you to do. But because he's God, he comes down and says, Oh, King's X, time's out. Suspend all of the laws. Forget what I said. Forget the promises. Forget all of my instructions in my word. And I'm just going to heal you as a unique situation. That's not how it works. You're hung by your tongue. And it's the integrity of God that holds everything together. And he cannot violate his word. You, in a sense, tie the hands of God. He told you to do certain things and you're doing exactly opposite to it and wonder why he's not coming through. So does the Bible back up what Andrew Womack is saying on the subject of sovereignty versus authority? Well, first of all, dominion does not imply power in words. To say that somebody has dominion 
there is no connection biblically there is no way he can connect the idea of dominion to you have power in your words and the ability to act in this world um, that just there's just no way you can get there uh, number two human dominion does not imply that God cannot act in this world it's as if let's just say the president of the United States were to put the vice president in charge saying I'm gonna step out and go on vacation or do whatever uh, that doesn't mean that the president now has no authority no ability to act in this country no he's still the president he's given a limited authority a limited dominion to the vice president and that's the same way with us God did not when he gave dominion to Adam and Eve did he did he, by no means did he give everything to them and now he is unable to act in this world we've seen verses already that said that God does these things God interacts in this world he um, causes death he causes sickness he causes poverty so there is no issue of the word faith concept of authority being taken from God he still has authority but still there's other examples in Psalm 50 verse 10 says that that God owns the cattle upon a thousand hills God still is the owner of everything that's going on here and we see God acting in ways that shows that God has the ability to act I mean think of the curses in the garden um, God cursed Adam and Eve and the serpent he didn't need them to give him authority so he could curse them did he I mean that just doesn't make sense but let's look at just a few more verses Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will he actively works things out that needs no explanation Psalm 115 verse 3 our God is in heaven he does whatever pleases him and Job 42 2 I know that you can do all things no purpose of yours can be thwarted God's not sitting in heaven just hoping somebody's gonna say the right faith-filled words so he can enact something no no purpose of God can be thwarted lastly Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 says this all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth no one can hold back his hand or say to him what have you done no one can do this because God has the power and the authority and he acts in this world to do his will and what pleases him as we've seen Andrew Womack denies or distorts what the Bible teaches in several important areas including God's ability to work in this world uh, what is the nature of prayer can we ask God for things and that you're currently prosperous and you need to use the power of your words or your authority to bring that prosperity here into this life these errors can not only cause confusion but sometimes serious harm we strongly encourage you to avoid his ministry and warn others to do likewise. For a printed summary of responses to Andrew Womack, uh, get in touch with us at the email address info at the centers .org. Thank you for watching and be sure to examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good.